Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Friday Morning Virtual Journal Club. Um, it is really a pleasure to have two outstanding pathologists who are going to be presenting this morning. Uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret Brandwine Weber is the Site Chief of Pathology at Mount Sinai West and Director of the Head Neck Pathology Fellowship Program. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Brandwine throughout a significant uh, percent portion of my career, um, and she has been academically uh, truly. It's eight o'clock. Um, Dr. Bramwine served as president of the North American Society of Head and Neck Pathology um, from 2006 to 2008, and took place or took part in the consensus committees for the World Health Organization. Uh, classification of head and neck tumors, the third edition and the fourth edition. She was on the head and neck expert panel for the eighth edition uh, American Joint Committee on Cancer um, Staging System. Um, she has published over 130 papers and over 50 book chapters, chapters as well as three single author textbooks. Um, currently, Dr. Bramwine is an investigator in an, in an NIH funded R01 related to uh, um, quantitative risk modeling for um, outcomes in oral cancer. Um, the discussion for this morning uh, is Dr. Virginia Lavolsi, who needs no introduction. Um, Dr. Lavolsi has spent her virtually her entire career at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has held a number of leadership positions, including head of surgical path and director of anatomic pathology. She's renowned. Um, for her skills as a diagnostic surgical pathologist, and uh, most notably in endocrine and head neck pathology. Uh, Dr. Lavolsi has written uh, multiple chapters and books, including one entitled Surgical Pathology of the Thyroid. Um, she has been the, uh, president of the United States um, College of American Pathologists, the Arthur Purdy Stout Society of Surgical Pathologists, and the Endocrine Pathology Society. So it is a, really a pleasure um, for both of these individuals to be here this morning to discuss um, a very important and very controversial topic. Um, and so with that, um, I will turn the program over, but just encourage everyone to please um, hit the uh, questions tab in order to um, pose any questions that you would like to address. Um, and we'll try to get to those at the very end of the uh, program. So with that, uh, Dr. Brandwine, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank you very much, Mark, for this opportunity to present at this um, at the Thank Thyroid um, webinars. They've been great. Okay, um, this is the story of a 52-year-old man who presents with a rapidly growing mass in the neck um, on ultrasound. The mass is described as a single solid nodule which is 4.3 in greatest dimension, with an oval shape wider than tall, ill-defined margins, the presence of coarse calcifications, and an FNA biopsy was performed and reported as malignant, Bethesda 6. Consequently, molecular tests were ordered displaying concomitant BRAF and TERT mutations. The patient was scheduled to undergo total thyroidectomy. Based on the above characteristics, the possible differential diagnosis of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, which of the following would you expect to see on the final pathology report? A, solid trabecular insular growth pattern. B, absence of conventional, conventional nuclear features of PTC. C, mitotic activity of three or more per 10 high power fields. Or D, tumor necrosis. Okay, uh, ah, let's see. Okay, well, okay, there's the spread, and uh, we'll come back to this. Um, so, again, thank you very much for this great opportunity. Um, I'm going to discuss this um, review article 
which was published in Thyroid in 2019 from the Memorial. Um, Ibrahim Pasek was the, was the lead author. Poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma emerged from what was thought to be a particularly aggressive form of follicular carcinoma, which was referred to as insular carcinoma. Branner introduced the term poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma in 1963. In the early 1980s, uh, two different groups, Carcangio, uh, reported on 25 cases, and Sakimoto reported on 35 cases, and they suggested that poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma is a distinct entity, which may also reveal uh, regions of typical PTC or follicular carcinoma. It became part of the WHO classification in the blue third edition of the Blue Book in 2004. Ronnie Gosain was the senior author of the uh, 2006 publication, which put forth the memorial criteria for poorly diff. And then Juan Rosai, he should rest in peace, was a senior author on the 2007 publication, which was known as the Turin Proposal. So let's go over the memorial definition. Uh, this was a, a study that was uh, published on 58 patients. 74% of these patients developed disease progression, and their five-year progression-free survival rate was 25%. 38% of these patients died of disease, and the five-year disease-specific survival rate was 60%. The criteria basically was necrosis. Any differentiated thyroid carcinoma, which also revealed necrosis, could be classified as poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. If there were no necrosis, then a mitotic rate of five or more mitotic figures per 10 uh, high power field um, was also used to classify as poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Invariably, necrosis and the high mitotic rate went together, but if the necrosis was lacking, the high mitotic rate was enough. So really growth pattern nuclear features were irre irrelevant to the diagnosis. So here is a case that is, could be classified or is classified as poorly diff according to the memorial definition. Um, it looks like a, it, it is a metastatic PTC. Um, however, the, the nuclear features of PTC happen to be lacking. Um, and then we see in the right hand side, um, tremendous necrosis. And so that this is a poorly diff by the memorial criteria. The Turin proposal was based on um, a study of, of uh, a multi-center uh, international study of 83 uh, cases and highlighted an unusual feature um, in these tumors that was not mentioned in the, in the memorial study. That is solid areas are relatively bland cells lacking PTC nuclei. The latter point that there's no PTC nuclei in the solid areas was is very important because there's a solid variant of PTC and that needs to be prognosticated together with regular well-differentiated thyroid cancers. So solidness is a spe specific feature and lacking PTC nuclei in these areas is important. Then in addition, at least one of the following findings needs also to be present. Necrosis, which is very common, uh, mitotic rate, of three or more uh, mitotic figures per 10 high power field or convoluted nuclei. And this, this finding was a little more difficult to, to um, pin down. Uh, convoluted nuclei are nuclei that are very obviously not PTC nuclei, and they happen to be smaller than the nuclei that you'll see in typical follicular thyroid carcinoma. It's very important to emphasize that in either criteria, there's no findings that would support the diagnosis of uh, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So here's the algorithm that had been published. Um, and as you see, you start off with the thyroid malignancy and you ask, well, is there any solid pattern? Um, if there is solid pattern, the next question is, uh, are there typical PTC nuclei throughout? If no, then you ask, are there, are there any of the following findings? Necrosis, high mitotic rate, convoluted nuclei, and so, um, yes, brings you to a diagnosis of poorly diff. So let's look at um, some, some more of these tumors. These can be classified as poorly diff by either criteria. Um, here you have an invasive thyroid cancer that you see on the top. And on the bottom panel, you can see that it's making uh, follicle follicular patterns. And this is the same tumor. In the top, we start seeing solid areas. 
And in the bottom panel, oops, sorry. In the bottom panel, and I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but in the bottom panel, there's a, there's a white arrow that shows you nucle uh, dropout of single cells. So that's apoptosis or single cell um, dropout, which is single cell necrosis, sorry. Uh, here's another uh, example. This has a ribbon-like or insular type of pattern. On the bottom, we can see on a uh, higher power, there's necrosis. And the inset panel is a MIB proliferative index, which is elevated. And here is yet another example. Um, this tumor is relatively bland. Um, we see in the center, uh, we see in the, in the top panel, necrosis. And in the bottom panel, we see epithelioid cells with more cytoplasm. The nuclei are clearly not PTC nuclei. Um, and there's prominent uh, mitotic activity. This is an example of um, on the top, the key 67 or MIB-1 proliferative index. And on the bottom panel, we see a P53 index. And the smaller inset again just shows you relatively bland cells. Um, they're not anywhere as pleomorphic as you would expect to see in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And they don't have the features of um, PTC. Um, what we see here are, are recommended indices for hot spots. And Oops, sorry. Um, the key 67 is, is rather helpful. Um, in well-differentiated thyroid carcinomas, you shouldn't see uh, more than 5% of cells cycling. In poorly diff, that index goes up to 10 to 30%. And in anaplastic, um, it's usually more than 30%. In um, uh, P53, again, you should hardly see anything positive in a well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Now, um, in these recommended indices, I, I would not be too dogmatic about it because um, it's not common for uh, it's not common for me to find um, hot spots of p53 of 50 percent or more in poorly diff. And so certainly I make the diagnosis without that. And in anaplastic, the same thing too. Uh, occasionally, I'll make a diagnosis of anaplastic with a p53 and even the key 67 is really below these indices. So, which of these systems has an advantage? Well, the radioactive iodine refractory PET positive thyroid cancers are associated with the diagnosis of poorly diff made by the, by the memorial criteria, but not by those tumors made by the turn criteria. Also, in an article by Zhu um, of 58 patients, all who had died from non-anaplastic thyroid carcinomas, all of these patients had more had one or more of the following features, gross extrathyroid extension, extensive vascular invasion, and um, they met the criteria for poorly thyroid carcinoma by the memorial criteria um, in either the primary, local METs, or distant METs. So uh, the metastatic tumor that I showed you in the very beginning with, um, that was only seen on metastasis, that would be by the, uh, by the memorial criteria. So, Think of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma as a tween tumor. In many aspects, it's worse than well differentiated thyroid carcinomas, but in other aspects, it's not quite as bad as anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So, for instance, um, gross extrathyroid extension is seen in 30% of, um, well, of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas, and the majority of anaplastic thyroid cancers present as T4. Distant METs are much more common in poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma than they are in well differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Um, comparison of the survival rates shows really the most dramatic differences and really shows more about tweenness, if you will. Um, the 10 year disease specific survival for well differentiated thyroid carcinoma is more than 90%. The five year disease specific survival for poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma is 66%. And Unfortunately, in um, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, the, the mean one-year survival is only 20%. Um, one of the, one of the um, uh, features or one of the problems with poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma that the authors um, emphasize is the fact that there are no standardized guidelines. There are, of course, standardized guidelines for well diff and for anaplastic, but none exist for poorly diff at this time. And the reason for that is that it's relatively rare, 2% uh, 
plus or minus 2% of all thyroid malignancies. And the group of tumors um, that have the diagnosis of poly diff are still heterogeneous. Mutation analysis of poly differential is crucial for our understanding and prognostication of this entity and can lead to developing new targeted therapies. This table was compiled um, by the authors and was, com was um, comprised of, of um, compilation of four publications analyzing a total of 120 patients. The largest study in this uh, series is a Landa uh, 2016, if you can see that in the, in the bottom panel. Um, and that was also from the Memorial Group and they had published the results of 84 patients. So RAS and BRAF still are common in this group and they're still mutually exclusive. BRAF mutations in poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas are associated with higher regional metastases, whereas RAS mutated poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas have higher rates of distant metastases. BRAF in general is less common in poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma than it is in well differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And another tween fact is that um, as you go from, from PTC to poorly differentiated to anaplastic, the mean number of mutations increases from one to two to six. Poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas with a higher mutational burden are associated with older age, larger tumors, distant metastases, and decreased overall survival. And when one compares um, fatal versus non-fatal poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas, there's a greater likelihood of seeing um, the following mutations. And some of these mutations are unique to poorly diff or are unique to poorly diff and anaplastic, but are not seen in well differentiated thyroid cancer. So TERT, MED12, which is mediator factor 12, we'll hear more about that. That's a unique, um, uh, um, mutation, um, our RNA binding motif, RBM10, um, BRAF, HRAS, P53, ATM, um, and also the trans translational uh, initiation factor, EIF1AX. So we'll come back to that. The TERT promoter mutation is the single most common mutation in uh, poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And again, another tween fact, uh, it goes from about 9% in, in PTC to 40% in this compilation to 65 to 73% in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Mutations in P53 are the most common tumor suppressor mutations. Um, and chromosomal rearrangements can be seen in 14% of poorly dips, um, namely the red PTC, PAX8 PPR gamma, and ALK translocations. Lastly, chromosomal gains in 1Q are associated with worse prognosis, and loss in 22Q is associated with RAS mutant poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma through transcriptional activation of RAS by the loss of the tumor suppressor gene NF2, which is on 22Q. So the treatment of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma is total thyroidectomy and removal of all clinical radiographically suspicious lymph nodes. As mentioned, there's no standardized guideline for adjuvant therapies in this rare tumor. So the main treatment challenge here is how to treat distant metastases as they're often refractory to usual treatment options. And the authors make the following recommendations. Um, all poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma should be sequenced for actionable targets. Um, in the future, patients with poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma should be eligible for inclusion into future anaplastic thyroid carcinoma trials. And also, they should be enrolled in basket studies, wherein patients are treated on their genomic profile rather than their specific histological diagnosis. And that's particularly useful for either rare tumors or rare mutations such as low prevalence mutations like RET, NTRK, or ALP. And these patients may be included in trials for selective kinase inhibitors. Targeted therapies for thyroid cancers had focused mostly on TKI tyrosine kinase inhibitors. 
um, the FDA has approved serafimib and levantinib in the treatment of progressive RAI refractory differentiated thyroid carcinomas. The results recently approved the BRAF inhibitor and trametinib, the MEK inhibitor, for inoperable or metastatic ATCs, anaplastic thyroid carcinomas. Tumor differentiation, that is, the restoration of RAI uptake through MAP inhibition, also holds potential. Salumetinib has been shown to restore RAI uptake in a subset of RAI refractory patients. The same has also been shown for dibrapenib. Restoration of, of RAI uptake takes place through the, up, through the activation of the sodium iodine semporter, and that's been demonstrated in, vi in vitro with serafimib, silumetinib, and also the histone deacetylase inhibitor, panobinostat. So another strategy is targeting multiple signal pathways, and this can prevent TKI resistance and also have possible synergistic effects. For instance, targeting MAPK, PI3 kinase, AKT, and the histone deacetylase pathways, or targeting PI3K mTOR inhibition plus Paclis Taxel. Other pathways can also be targeted, such as, the pro, such as with the proteasome inhibitor, bortezomide, which blocks the NFK beta pathway. And carboxantinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which blocks the HIF-1 alpha hypoxia pathway and the VEGF pathway. There's a renewed interest in TERP-based immunotherapy. Uh, the increased expression of TERT antigen by cancer cells increases their vulnerability to T cell recognition and attack. Lastly, um, one can capitalize on some of the unique um, uh, mutations that have been found within poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So as a, for instance, initiation of transcription is controlled by the pre-initiation complex, which is, a, which is a component of which is called mediator. Mediator combines with cyclin D kinase A subcomplex, which contains MED12, the mediator complex subunit 12. MED12 mutation found in 40% of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas and can be targeted by serafimib, which is multiple TKI cyclin D kinase inhibitor, and synexin A, uh, a cyclin D kinase 819 inhibitor. So, in conclusion, Think about poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma as a tweener, cell differentiated thyroid carcinoma, and anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Patients tend to present with advanced disease. Um, and the memorial criteria correlate with RAI positive thyroid cancer and also fatal non anaplastic thyroid cancer. However, the do give a home for a histological distinct subset of tumors. And this is especially possible when these tumors have no PTC um, component. So really, what would you call them? You know, they're they're um, re relatively bland, they have necrosis, they can't go into the category of PTC or follicular carcinoma, and yet they're not as bad as anaplastic. So tumor criteria uh, tumors, although they have necrosis, still they're more distinct than, for instance, a PTC with necrosis. So while it may not have predictive value, it certainly gives a home and a diagnosis for these tumors. And um, as I've said, the benefits of adjuvant are really inconclusive and the development of decision therapies is much needed. Okay, thank you. I want to start um, my discussion by um, putting a little bit of salt in the wound, as it were. Okay. And I want to define grade versus differentiation. And this has absolutely nothing to do with thyroid. This is all tumors, all comers. And grade is defined as how closely a tumor is histolo histologically resembling the tissue of origin. Now, in the thyroid, most tumors are papillary carcinomas, 
and that's not what the thyroid usually looks like, the normal thyroid, but these are considered low grade. And if one goes by the old fashioned Mayo Clinic Broder's grading system, they, they would 90% plus of papillary carcinomas would be considered grade one. Differentiation is a little bit different. And Dr. David Dalene from the Mayo Clinic, a world famous orthopedic pathologist, in defining dedifferentiation in chondrosarcoma, said that you can see areas of tumor which no longer resemble the original tumor, but are apparently coming from that original tumor, and they grow as solid masses with atypical nuclei, necrosis, and many mitoses. The paper that was just discussed and that they, we are considering today um, has poorly differentiated carcinoma defined as a tumor of follicular cell differentiation. That is, it is thyroglobulin and TTF1 positive. The presence of greater than five mitoses per 10 high power fields and true tumor necrosis distinguished from the kind of change you see in needle tracts or core biopsy tracts. So this is true tumor necrosis and Dr. Brandwein has illustrated some of that for you. The Turin criteria stressed growth pattern, solid trabecula insular or a combination of these, again, necrosis, high mitotic activity, and the absence of PTC nuclei, unless the poorly differentiated tumor was arising from a papillary carcinoma, either classic or more commonly follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, or there was a previous tumor that was a differentiated papillary carcinoma. The WHO definition in 2017, the latest edition of WHO, was similar to Turin, but they put in that you could have only 10% of a tumor that showed these characteristics and had a poor prognosis. Other literature, older literature, indicated that in order to call a tumor poorly differentiated, 75% or more of it should be poorly differentiated. So this is another area of controversy. How much poorly differentiated is truly poorly differentiated in terms of the prognosis of the patient? Another hooker is that you can have poorly differentiated carcinomas that are encapsulated, at least in part. And even though these tumors have all of the very worrisome histologic characteristics, uh, they can, these patients may live quite a long time. Now, from differentiated, let's go to grade. And there is a tumor which has been called high grade thyroid carcinoma. Most are papillary, rarely are they true follicular carcinoma. And the most important thing is that they maintain papillary or follicular growth pattern. So we do not have, as per the Turin definition, solid, trabecular, or insular growth pattern. These tumors may maintain, at least in part, papillary thyroid carcinoma nuclei, but they have true necrosis and a high mitotic rate. It has been shown that subtypes of papillary carcinoma have an association with prognosis, such as tall cell variant, but the grade, that is unequivocal papillary carcinoma that has necrosis, mitosis, cytological atypia, vascular invasion, has a much more significant association with outcome. So there are pathological differences, in my opinion, between high grade and poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. In high grade, you have the maintenance of the growth pattern, either papillary or follicular, and you may have nuclei that remain present. However, both of them have necrosis, and that's really, really important. Mitotic activity, some abnormal mitotic activity, vascular invasion, and cytological atypia. And just because I'm a pathologist, you have to look at some uh, histologic pictures. This is a poorly differentiated carcinoma growing in a solid pattern. And on the bottom, you see a focus of vascular invasion. This is insular pattern with tremendous necrosis around the islands of tumor cells. 
which maintain viability because they are close to blood vessels. And you can see in the upper right, a presence of necrosis. This is a high-grade papillary carcinoma. This is a papillary carcinoma. Granted, in this area, the nuclei are no longer present, but the papillae are. And in all of this tumor, this tumor was totally papillary. You can see in the bottom right, areas of necrosis. Mitotic activity was also prominent. So are there prognostic differences between high-grade carcinoma and poorly differentiated carcinoma? If there are, then the pathologist needs to separate these two. Are there molecular differences? Probably. We know uh, that poorly differentiated carcinoma has a whole different variety of molecular changes from mutations in RAS, TERT, P53, et cetera. High grade has not been systematically studied, but most of them that have been studied, and these are even rarer than poorly differentiated carcinoma, do have mutations in BRAF. So what is needed, in my opinion, is careful pathologic studies. And because of the rarity of both types of tumors, this may need to be multi-institutional to get enough cases with long-term follow-up to show any differences in outcome if they actually exist. If there are differences, then pathologists need to be splitters, like many of us are anyway, and not lumpers. However, if there are no differences in prognosis, then I think we can just lump them all together and treat them in the same way based on their molecular signatures uh, and therefore targeted therapies. Now, I would like to just quote something from Dr. Giovanni Tolini from the University of Bologna in Italy, who wrote this review article on this topic in 2011. And he said, poorly differentiated carcinoma is not a synonym for high-grade thyroid cancer. Tumors that are aggressive and have lost the ability to retain iodine are not always poorly differentiated, that's true. And carcinomas that are poorly differentiated may be relatively indolent, especially if they're surrounded by a capsule. So I think we have differences. I have nothing to declare and we're back to the poll question. Um, so I, I do not have, I guess we have to vote again. Yes, we'll open this up to our audience. Great. Well, I'd like to uh, thank both of you for uh, really outstanding presentations this morning. And um, I have two questions um, uh, that I'd like to pose to both of you. Um, should we rather than um, thinking about these as separate entities, consider um, there to be a spectrum of pathology and disease um, uh, prognosis and a spectrum of uh, biologic behavior. Um, can you just comment on that? Um, or, or should we try to put these into separate buckets? I, I think that um, in the, th that there is a spectrum uh, in all thyroid carcinomas that are of follicular derivation. However, I don't think we have enough data on these particular groups. We have a lot of information on well-differentiated thyroid cancer. We have a significant amount of information on anaplastic thyroid cancer, but these two groups, the poorly differentiated and the high grade, because they are so unusual and uncommon, we really don't have enough information. It's my personal opinion that it is a spectrum, but again, without data, I don't think you can say that for sure. And I, uh, there, there was a, uh, 
And the paper, I have never seen the paper, but two years, a year and a half ago, at our national pathology meeting, there was an abstract from the Brigham in Boston on five cases of what they called high-grade papillary carcinoma. And they compared them from a molecular point of view, as well as from a prognostic outcome point of view, with a group of poorly differentiated carcinoma based on the Turin criteria. And what they found was, and again, with very small numbers, that the patients who had what they defined as high-grade papillary carcinoma actually did worse than the group that were defined by them as poorly differentiated carcinoma. They also found in the cases that they did molecular analysis on that all of their high-grade papillary carcinomas were BRAF mutated, whereas the molecular signatures of the group in poorly differentiated carcinomas had multiple different areas of mutation. So um, they came out with the conclusion based on a very small number of cases that there is in fact a difference between poorly differentiated carcinoma where the pattern is different, the growth pattern is different, and high grade papillary carcinoma where you still can recognize it as a papillary carcinoma. Um, in my experience, and I have not seen a lot of these cases, again, because they're very unusual, I think they are different, um, but I don't have enough data and long-term follow-up to be able to say that they behave differently or not. Um, and I, that's why I think if we're going to get a real handle on this and real data, we need to do a multi-institutional study wherein we can collect enough of these cases very carefully pathologically defined and then find out what happened to them, to the patients. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Margie. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree that it that it is a spectrum because um, anything with just a small amount of necrosis could be called either can either fit into turn classification or the memorial classification. And so, in fact, some of the most compelling, um, although anecdotal, um, uh, reasoning for the uh, memorial classification is that some of their tumors were very small could be classified as micro PTCs, and yet these patients died of disease. And without the memorial um, classification, there would be no explanation for why these patients died of disease. And also, we know that any tumor of any size that has anything within it that can be called poorly diff is poorly diff. So, um, so yes, there's a spectrum in terms of the mutational burden, in terms of the histology, and and not just a spectrum, but sort of parallel paths leading leading to the same diagnostic bucket. And as Virginia said, we need more information to um to basically tease that out. But um, I guess one of the take home messages is that is that not all that poorly diff, although as a tweener group, um, still can be parsed out into worse than well diff, but uh, better than some of the more high uh, mutational high burden poorly diff. Great. Can you just comment? Um, mitosis is always uh, given as a binary um, identification or a binary reading in a path report. Is there any value to looking at um, degree of necrosis? Is that, a, is that of any value whatsoever oh. or? You know what? You're right in that it's it is it's sort of the focal key to get you through a door, you know. Um, and I don't I don't know if there's enough data to say more necrosis is worse, although intuitively it makes sense. Virginia, think, do you have any? I think, I think yeah. any necrosis is necrosis, and that's bad. So even if right. you just see a, a small area of necrosis, that's true tumor necrosis. Uh, I think that, right. that that is a bad finding. The more okay. necrosis, right. the worse, but, but I think if you have it, that's bad. Great. Well, thank you. Um, can um, uh, We have a, the, the pleasure and the honor of having two additional widely recognized pathologists who are in attendance this morning. And what I'd like to do is to unmute um, Dr. Ron Gossain and Dr. Juan Hernandez-Pereira, 
um, and have them comment on this morning's topic and the presentations. Ronnie, uh, everyone, ready? welcome. All right, yep. if you hear me, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, uh, it's Ronnie Gossain. So thank you, Margie and Dr. Divorci, for this wonderful uh, presentation. I just want to clarify the the issue of, of the definition. I will try, I'm going to try to make it very simple for the clinician. Ronnie, we lost you. I think we have, um, we're Is having. Now the reason. Yes. Now I, yes. Yeah, the reason I stressed a lot on the memorial definition is because, unfortunately, the College of American Pathologists uh, does not include grading as a uh, essential criterion. They don't even include mitosis and necrosis. So uh, uh, just uh, not to be too long, uh, I just want to say that uh, the, both de uh, definition capture something different in a sense that the memorial definition, definition capture high grade PTC if you want, or high and high grade follicular together, while the the Turin proposal captures high grade follicular carcinoma. And of course, there are differences between uh, uh, high grade follicular carcinoma and high grade PTC because one uh, some have uh, uh, PTC have BRF they travel to lymph node while the others travel uh, to a uh, distant site. So in conclusion, I think for the clinician it's very important really because what we all agree upon we differ on the definition that mitosis and necrosis are essential about this and it's dr divolsi who found this in her article a long time ago with somebody from sweden right dr divolsi i think and so i think yeah i think what is really important for the clinician is when you see that a pathologist is reporting on mitosis and necrosis you have to be very careful and ask them if this is a regular papillary carcinoma or not, because some may call it just PTC papillary or moderately differentiated papillary carcinoma. Now, quickly, the degree of necrosis. Uh, in our study at Memorial, uh, we did not find a difference, but we, of course, more studies um, are needed. Um, the reason I stress on mitosis necrosis is that in our initial study, when we did multivariate analysis, the growth pattern did not have any effect of prognosis. So whether the tumor was a solid, uh, had solid growth pattern like fetal thyroid or papillae or follicle, there was no difference in prognosis. The only really uh, parameters that made the difference are mitosis and necrosis. And finally, I just would like to touch about the issue of children, uh, this tumor when they are described in children. So I have seen some in children. I don't know if Dr. Brando and Libotti have seen. and. Um, I'm not sure that in children they have such a bad prognosis. There have been an article uh, stating they have. So this is an interesting issue of uh, of research. So this is what I would like to say. Great, um, Ronnie. Can I just ask you: um, is um, is the size of the primary tumor and the um, percent area of necrosis? Do they correlate in any way? Uh, in our study, uh, the percent of necrosis did not correlate. However, you know, uh, as Dr. Ivozzi said, these tumors are rare. But in our, yeah, if you have a little bit or a lot, it's um, it's uh, really, uh, it looks the same. Whatever, what drove outcome within our series based on mitosis necrosis are what drives outcome in any thyroid carcinoma, which is encapsulation. Uh, extensive extrathyroid extension, vascular invasion. So microstaging is king at the end. I mean, you have um, microstaging always uh, uh, is superior uh, to grading. And uh, Dr. Ivosi mentioned the encapsulated tumor. Most of them, if they don't have extensive vascular invasion, the encapsulated, poorly differentiated, uh, they uh, do uh, very well. But uh, yeah. Ronnie, what about the size of the tumor and, and the degree of necrosis? Is there any correlation there? Uh, the degree of necrosis, as I said, no, uh, we did not find. The size uh, of the tumor, uh, yes, there was, uh, <clears throat> there was uh, definitely a, a correlation, if I remember, in, uh, uh, in, uh, even in multivariate analysis with the, uh, with the size uh, um, uh, of, of the tumor. Okay. Juan, 
um, I believe you're uh, able to um, uh, to contribute here. Yeah, I, I agree with what has been said. And first, I believe that there's a spectrum. And, and remember, a pathology report is just a snapshot on of a, the biological continuum. That, that's one thing. And then the fact of mitosis and necrosis, this is something that we actually report in, in our, at least in our practice with Dr. Wenig. It's like whenever we see a tumor, especially a what's a so-called classical papillary that starts having mitosis and necrosis without really fulfilling the Turing criteria, we mention that in our report and we actually give a call to our clinicians to make them aware, look, this might be a papillary thyroid carcinoma that might behave worse than your classical one. So do, sorry, sorry. Do you use the do you use the term high grade one or no? We, just say the, the term we use is high grade transformation, which then signifies the same. But we use papillary thyroid carcinoma with high grade transformation. See comment, and then in the comment we explain that even though there's still a classical papillary thyroid carcinoma in the background, there is ne tumor necrosis and increased mitotic activity. We typically try to give a, a number of a specific number of the mitosis and, and discuss that with the clinician. Okay, I personally, I so, as long as this tumor I flagged, I mean, you can call them apple green disease, as long as that's why we do, we use our definition, as long as the, the clinician is worried that this is not the garden variety of papillary carcinoma because, uh, you know, you don't want the, the clinician to uh, underestimate the tumor and then find the patient in a few years, not only with the recurrent tumor, but also with a tumor that is refractory to radioactive iodine. No, no, I completely agree. That's the reason we put that in a comment and explain those findings there. Right. I, I like your comment, Ronnie, about calling it apple green. Uh, I would find, I would say that probably the, the most common egregious error that I encounter when I look at um, referred work in is um, the uh, outside knowledge failing to make mention of the presence of necrosis and calling something just a standard PTC. So, um, so that really, you know, one of the worst omissions um, that one could make for, for exactly your reasons, just whatever you call it, make sure everybody's aware that that's an extraordinarily poor prognosticator. Great. So we have a couple of questions from our participants. Uh, the first one is whether or not vascular invasion and lymphatic invasion should be looked upon um, in uh, the same in terms of uh, disease prognosis. Can you, one of you comment on that? Anne, you want to take it? Or? Oh, go ahead, Fauci. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, no, they're they're quite different. In the in the olden days, we could just reference to lymphovascular invasion, and now with with our knowledge, um, it's really necessary to. And so, of course, vascular invasion, uh, extensive vascular invasion, defined as four or more vessels that are involved, um, is a poor prognosticator. Whereas um, uh, lymph is not. In a cell prosecutor. And, and I don't know how often you want to see extensive LDI. Okay. Um, you were breaking Ron? up a little bit. Yeah. Let me, um, another Sorry. question relates to whether or not immunohistochemistry, and particularly the loss of thyroglobulin staining, can be used to distinguish um, okay. these entities from well differentiated thyroid cancer. Interesting question. Uh, I will routinely, uh, when I'm looking up a tumor, or I'm a little bit very liberal with from the, the following four stains. I see um, uh, T653. Also look at TF1, look at thyroglobulin, and also beta catenin. And I found a subset of tumors. Um, you can see decreasing of uh, TF1 expression of membrane beta catenin um, as evidence of the tumor beta progression. Great. Um, Dr. Uh, Coben has addressed the question uh, to Dr. Gassain and Dr. Lavolsi regarding uh, poorly differentiated um, thyroid cancer in the younger age group, and she poses the question of whether or not um, uh, and others have seen these cases and uh, whether or not um, there is an attempt to collect the series from 
younger individuals. Uh, this really harkens back to one of our former journal clubs on pediatric thyroid cancer, where there is an initiative to create a registry of uh, pediatric thyroid cancers. And so that is actually underway. Um, uh, and, and I think it's being spearheaded by um, the group at CHOP. Um, but uh, Ronnie, do you want to just elaborate on um, what you mentioned about pediatric poorly diff um, thyroid cancer? Sure, sure. Do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah. so basically you can find in a patient under the age of 21 or 18, whatever you define pediatric thyroid carcinoma, tumor that fulfill the Turin proposal and even and also of course tumor that uh, fulfill our uh, our definition here at memorial uh, the uh, they are rare uh, but the big question as you said we're not at all sure if uh, they do poorly i can tell you the few i had and that we had enough follow-up they did all very well now you have to realize that Finding mitosis in general in pediatric tumor is sometimes common. It, it may not be a marker of, uh, of uh, aggressiveness. Uh, even finding necrosis in pediatric tumor, I'm not sure. For example, in some diffuse closing vent of papillary carcinoma, a rare aggressive band, you can ha have necrosis and they still do clinically well. So to answer your question, uh, in my limited experience, I uh, I do uh, I did not see really a signal here when we did the statistical analysis that fully differentiated in the kids are worse. But of course, uh, this is uh, the numbers are, are small, and uh, we simply need to uh, uh, to study more. Great. Um, and uh, one last question uh, related to the role of um, KI67 um, and its value as a uh, either as a prognosticator or as a differentiator here. Uh, do you want me to answer or let Margie or Dr. Uh, Dr. Lavolsi, do you want to comment on that? I think um, the studies show that you count mitoses on h &E slides not do KI67 proliferative index. So I think um, what I would use a KI67 for would be to show me the areas where I should go back on the H&E and actually count the mitoses. Um, I don't use it terribly much, so I don't have a huge experience, but I think it's a little bit finicky, and I would prefer to just count mitoses on H&E sections. Ronnie, do you agree? Uh, yeah, actually, I completely agree. And even actually, I didn't publish it, but I compared uh, KI67 and the counting of mitosis on H&E, and I was surprised to find out that counting uh, mitosis was actually uh, much better. But maybe you can use the KI67 for what Dr. Livosi will call hotspots for to just uh, yes. uh, look for mitosis. But uh, I would definitely uh, go uh, by... Uh, uh, by mitosis on on H and E, I agree totally. Margie, do you want to comment? Yeah, interesting. I'm I'm little with it because um, I used to be certain is not usual in in tumors that have some areas, but I don't think not or perhaps questionable necrosis. So I, I use it to to rule in that something is still within a well differentiated thyroid carcinoma category. Great, terrific. And is is that hold true for p fifty three as well, or does that should that be looked at differently? Yeah, p p fifty three talk about finicky. So I'll do it, but you know, um, it sometimes I'll do it and ignore it. You know. Okay. Ronnie, do you have any other thoughts on P53 here? Yeah, I uh, actually my answer is very simple. Uh, I simply do do not use it uh, because very rarely you can have P53 in uh, in papillary carcinoma. And um, although I did one study, and of course there was a correlation between P53 and the presence of poorly differentiated, but 
you cannot take it to the bank, so to speak. Like it, it, it's a bit like it's even worse than KI67 in in my in our hands. It could be due to the fact that yeah. our PPP3 is not very good. I have no idea, but I wouldn't uh, definitely. It's very important not to be the slave to the to the immunostain in that situation. Great. Great. Right. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank all of our. Can uh, I make a comment? Yeah, sure, Virginia. Yes. Okay. Uh, with regard to the KI67, I would just make a plea to all the pathologists who are on this webinar. Please, please, please do not let thyroid tumors become uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract, uh, where the literature and the various groups are always at war about KI-67 and how you grade those tumors. Please keep the thyroid clean. Just do mitotic counting <laughs> on h and &E blood. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. We're from the wise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Well, listen, I want to again thank um, uh, Dr. Bramwine, Dr. Lavolsi, Dr. Gassane, and Dr. Fernandez Pereira for being a part of this discussion. It was really outstanding. Um, and to all our participants, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. Um, uh, and we will be back again next Friday. But um, if any of your colleagues or trainees would, uh, were not able to uh, watch this, incredibly educational um, presentation. This will become available um, on Monday and uh, you'll receive notification about that. Everyone stay safe and um, have a great weekend. Thank you.